Canadians are bracing for a COVID dramatic change in everyday life. The first for death of an American COVID-19. The 2020 Summer Olympics, now the latest major sports cancellation caused by the global COVID-19 pandemic. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us here tonight for the fifth and final session. It's hard to believe that this is the fifth session already of the Bison Transport Sport Leadership Series. Now, tonight's topic is on role models, who they are and why they matter. I'm looking forward to this discussion here this evening over the next hour. My name is Sarah Orleski. I'm so happy to be able to be back hosting this, this has been a wonderful series. If you haven't had the opportunity to check out the first four installments of it, uh, I'm recommending that you go to the Sport Manitoba website or Sport Manitoba's YouTube channel. You'll be able to get it on demand there. Definitely worth your time as we'll continue to discuss throughout this evening. This series brings together inspirational leaders from all areas of sport to tell their personal and professional stories, offer valuable advice and guidance and share practical tips that hopefully you'll be able to use to be on or off the field of play. As always, we would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we work, live, and play are the traditional lands and waterways of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, and Dene peoples, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties made here and are grateful to work, live, and play on this land. So welcome to all of our attendees, and in particular, of course, our friends at Bison Transport. We're excited to have all of you here with us tonight. Sport Manitoba, in partnership with Bison Transport, aspires to increase female engagement in sport by providing an informative, inclusive, and inspirational experience throughout this series. Here is another look at our title sponsor, Bison Transport. If there's some young women out there who really need some extra advice or support, I would just say keep going. That's the biggest one because there's going to be so many barriers in your way and we are good enough. We can do all these things. Love what you do and do what you love. Make sure that you don't let anyone else define you or put you in a box. For every one person that's rude or mean or a bully, there's going to be a hundred people that are going to support you. I said the biggest thing is is to not limit your scope and not limit your dreams. Know inside yourself what you can do and surround yourself with people who help you achieve those goals. So a few housekeeping notes before we get started, especially with some of the weather that we've been dealing with to date recently going to talk about bandwidth and internet quality. So stop me if you've heard this before, but um, if you are having any issues with your internet, one of the things that you can do is that you can click on the click here to switch stream to view at a lower bandwidth. So your video quality will be impacted, audio will not though, it will remain the same. And if you're having any technical issues, you can click on the request help bubble on the bottom right corner of the webcast page your help request will be emailed back to the email address that you provided. Throughout tonight's session, we encourage you to ask questions using the question box on the right-hand side of the webcast and to engage on social media. We have a great panel. We'd love to answer your questions. We want to make sure that we can tailor this to you as well. So always use Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, 
taking Sport Manitoba and also including the hashtag lead her, her all capital, all capitalized, ship, lead her ship. Now, as we get going, just before I introduce our panel this evening, I want to put a, a report that came out. It's the rally report that came out from Canadian Women in Sport in 2020. And if you look at the chart shown, you'll see lots of people are helping to support girls in sport and that the variety of influencers is valuable to create positive sport experiences. Research shows that it is particularly important to have same gender role models because women in influential positions can challenge stereotypes about gender and leadership and offer diverse insight and advice to women and girls. Tonight's panel will share stories about their role models and how their influence led them to the sport environment in which they live now. We know that parents and siblings can be very, family members can be very influential, but obviously so too can coaches, elite athletes. There's so many different ways for people to be able to make an impact on the next generation. So let's get to our panel. I mentioned it's a great panel, uh, very diverse when you look at the sports involved for it. So very excited, first off, to start with Elizabeth Dara. Maybe a little wave, Elizabeth. All right, there we go. <laughs> is the executive director of Speed Skating Manitoba, volunteers on numerous committees and steering groups with Speed Skating Canada and Sport Manitoba. The Williamson Dara family has been heavily involved in speed skating in Manitoba and Canada for over 60 years. And the family's involvement, everything from being athletes, coaches, volunteers, administrators, and more. Next, Daria Horkara Palmer has been involved, big wave, uh, <laughs> has been involved in sport for over 20 years. She was on the Canadian national fencing team for 12 years before transitioning to be head coach of her fencing club and the assistant provincial fencing coach in Manitoba. She graduated from the University of Manitoba with a degree in recreation management and community development, and is currently consulting for the anti-racism and sport campaign in the Canadian Fencing Federation on their gender equity project. Daria also volunteers on several boards as the president of the Provincial Council of Women of Manitoba, secretary of Trails Manitoba, and as the chair of the University of Manitoba Faculty of Kinesiology and Recreation Management Advisory Board. Last but certainly not least, Dallas Ludwig. Hello, Dallas. Thanks for joining us today. Has over 20 years experience building positive and productive team cultures and helping others to be their most awesome self. As a high performance coach in diving, Dallas has helped divers at all level, levels to go for it, whether that be physically, mentally, and emotionally, all in pursuit of their goals. Her athletes have become Canadian national champions, NCAA national champions, and have won medals at many international competitions, including Pan Am Games, Commonwealth Games, and World University Games. Dallas's overall goal in sport is to provide a platform for people to be very courageous and to constantly strive to become the best version of themselves. So welcome to all three of you. Thank you so much for being a part of our panel over this next hour. Looking forward to all of the insights that you three are able to provide us right, from your experiences. And as we get going tonight, I'm going to start with you, Daria, but this question I'll pose to all three of you. I want to know before we really get into role models, when you look at your specific sport, what is it that first attracted you to your sport? How did you become involved in fencing? Um, how did I get involved in fencing? I loved Zorro and Robin Hood growing up. They were like my idols. And I watched those movies over and over again. I think my dad got sick of it. So he thought uh, he would take me to fencing class. So he took me to fencing and I tried it out. And actually my first experience in the sport wasn't the best experience. I actually didn't really enjoy it that much. But it, then when um, someone came to my school when I was in grade six, um, her name was Patty Howes. And she was the uh, coach of the Lightning Fencing Club, which I am now the head coach of. And she reintroduced me to fencing and I absolutely fell in love with it. And it, I think it really shows that it's not so much always the sport, but it's also the people who are involved in the sport and who really like make you gravitate towards it. And that's what it really was for me is that I loved fencing. I love the concept of fencing, but what really took me in was the leadership and the coach that, that inspired me to want to join fencing. And then I, and then I was hooked and I, I couldn't stop going. What about for you, Elizabeth? I mean, with the long family history of it, I don't <laughs> know if you had any choice, but to become involved in speed skating, but what was it that you loved about the sport? 
Yeah, I mean, you definitely got that right. I was basically <laughs> born into it. And uh, so I kind of started when I was three years old, I think. Um, that being said, though, I I kind of in my angsty teen years, I wanted to be nothing like my family. And I kind of went on my own way in, in a different direction. And then uh, after university, I kind of got pulled back into it. And now we all work in speed skating in some capacity. So I tried to be different, but I just came right back. Yeah. The pull was too strong. <laughs> exactly. Dallas, for you with diving, what was it? Uh, actually, I had been in gymnastics as a youngster and uh, I got injured and I just, honestly, I don't know what made me think of diving. I don't actually remember wanting to be a diver. I just remember my first day suddenly walking through the change room and honestly, I think I was in love within a week. It was just the feeling of the sport felt so awesome to me and I had a really great coach. Um, to just to agree with what Daria said, you know, I had a really great coach out of the gates who just made me feel like, you know, I was important and here I was this teenager, super insecure and all that. And I felt like someone really believed in me. Amazing. And, you know, I think that just when I hear you say that you come from a gymnastics background, to me, that would just seem if you're not going to continue, but if you were to move into the pool, that me diving does seem like a natural transition with, uh, with those two sports. But let's get into our topic a little bit more here tonight. And I'm going to start with you, Elizabeth. And you mentioned just obviously you didn't really even have much of a choice but in terms of getting involved in speed skating because of the family connection for it. Can you explain a little bit more about the involvement of your family and the impact that that had on you? Uh, of course, yeah, I tr I'll try not to go to in depth because it'll t it takes a while, but um, my parents were both involved. My, uh, um, I guess, uh, my mom used to be the executive director, which I am now, and um, my dad was the provincial team coach, and uh, then he actually moved into a position with uh, the national organization as the technical director. Um, and he passed away when I was quite young, but when we, uh, when we, we ended up coming back to Manitoba and uh, all stayed involved in the sport, our, our mom was also a coach. And then, you know, we carried on as athletes and my two of my brothers stayed quite involved. And uh, my older brother, Tyler, he actually um, spent time on the national team for probably close to a decade and his wife as well. And then he decided to take on the role of provincial coach when the position came available, um, I guess about six years or eight years. I don't even know. I can't do the math. Six years ago or so. And uh, then a position came available for the executive director role. And I um, just kind of worked out timing wise and I applied and um, and have been in this job ever since. So it's, it's interesting that uh, both my brother and I were in roles that uh, our parents did. So kind of neat and just the, um, you know, it's a very close knit community. So the um, relationships that have been built just across, you know, current athletes, past athletes, coaches, it, it's pretty uh, amazing to be a part of it. When you have the family connections that you have to that sport, I'm sure that role models come in a variety of different forms and with different people, depending at what stage that you're at. And so let's delve into a little bit about the importance of role models and the impact that they have had on all of you. And Dallas, we start with you on that. When you think of role models for you, whether it was when you were an athlete or maybe you're transitioning into more of a coaching role, who do you look at as being a role model for you? I, I have pretty much the opposite story. Uh, no one in my family would have considered themselves an athlete. Um, I guess my dad was like a beer league bowler and baseball guy, but <laughs> that was about it. So <clears throat> I, I was kind of the first one coming up that was super, super into sport. And I actually didn't have any female coaches or was really around any female coaches for a really long time. I actually, you know, my first coach was male, the, the head coach was male, the assistant head coach was male. Um, and, and even when I started coaching, um, all the coaches around me, 
within my home team were male, which was fine. I mean, I, my very first coach, like I said, was awesome. But, uh, you know, the first time that I had a really good encounter with what I thought was going to be my most awesome female mentor was a little ways down the road when I had um, found myself as the team manager on a senior national team trip. And I was with a very decorated, very celebrated female coach rooming with her. And I remember, you know, I was so excited to just ask her all these questions. And it was such a weird experience for me because <laughs> she actually told me not to take up coaching. She said it was a really difficult job that, you know, you had to marry someone with lots of money because you'd never make any, that, you know, it was really difficult. You wouldn't be able to have children. And she basically just said, like, I don't advise it. And I remember sitting there going, okay, that was not what I was expecting. And, you know, I was in my early 20s and <clears throat> it, was, it was a bit jarring, but it was interesting because, you know, I did keep pers persevering in coaching. And I think it just made me feel like, I think it was really difficult for the generation before me. And now it's a bit better for my generation. And I know that I work really hard to be a mentor so that the next generation coming up can have even a smoother path. Yeah, I'm just following up on that, that made a little bit more of the impact that that would have. You know, imagine, you can find mentors, or all, I mean, all over, whether male or female, but to go in with the expectation of what she might say and the knowledge that you'll get and she tries to dissuade you from being a part of it or it how does that impact the way that you approach things now when you're speaking with people yeah i mean at the time it was it was definitely jarring but i was so full of enthusiasm about coaching at that time that nothing i think was going to knock me down at that young age um, but now I, I do think about it pretty often as I work with um, mentees myself, and I, I think I try to give them the advice to avoid those types of scenarios, like all those scenarios that she laid out as inevitable barriers, you know, how to kind of set yourself up from the beginning to, you know, to be able to set boundaries, to be able to put yourself first, to be able to do the things that you need to do to be able to do it life as a coach and do it the way you want to do it when you are Jerry, if you how has how have role models only like female role models if you go specifically with that impacted you and impact whether that be when you were as an athlete and then also as you segued into coaching um, I think for me, I didn't have a female mentor um, to get into sport. My father was sort of like my my sport enthusiast in my life. He is a, a refugee from Chile. And so when he came to Canada, girls didn't really play sports because he's from Chile. So girls didn't play sports. And when he saw a girl in a soccer field, he thought it was like the greatest thing. And he's like, I'm going to put my daughter into soccer. So that was my first introduction to sport. And it was with a male coach. Um, it wasn't until... I joined fencing and I had that female coach and that role model and she really, I just wanted to gravitate to her. She really inspired me. She really treated me like an athlete, regardless of whether I was a, a child or a girl or whatever, whatever I identified with. It was more so about like, what was my what was my capability? And then how could she make me stronger? And how could she bring out the best in me as an athlete? And I think that's what really, that's what really inspired me to realize that I will go as far as I want to go as long as I, I work hard. And it was uh, something that my mother had also instilled in me as well as a child is that, you know, if you work hard, you'll get there. And as much as long as you put in the work, you'll get there. And so having a coach and having someone who believed in me as well for my, my other attributes, it was, a, it was really impactful. And that relationship that I developed with her as a mentor, as a coach, even though after when she wasn't my coach because she had, had moved away, my transition to dipping out being a coach, I took a lot of the, the characteristics that I saw in her. And that was the kind of coach that I wanted to be because it was what I valued in, in my own coaching experience. And I wanted to be that for someone else. So it was a really big, I think it was really impactful for me to see a positive role model and then to be able to want to share that with other people because of the impact it did have on me. When you look at the fencing community right now and their coaching ranks, are there a lot of female coaches? Um, it's growing. It's growing. And the reason it's growing is because there are more 
uh, female coaches. And the more female coaches you have, the more likely you're, you're able to garner more interest in from other female coaches. And then the more female coaches you have, the more female participants you're going to have. So fencing is a very male dominated sport, not only um, in Manitoba, but across the world. But the more female coaches you do have, the more likely you are to have a larger representation in your club. And I think my club right now, we have two, fe three female coaches and four male coaches. And so we have a pretty decent split. We have about 40, 60, uh, 40 uh, women, 60 men sort of split. And that's pretty good. We're getting very close to 50, 50, and we're endeavoring to always do more. Obviously, Elizabeth, you think of speed skating in Manitoba. I mean, the the number of things, whether it be Susan Ott and Claire Hughes, and you, there's um, there is such a long history of successful female speed skaters. When you look at it, then the coaching ranks. When you look at the administrators, is it thing where you see a lot of women continue to stay in the sport after they finish participating? Yeah, I would, I mean, I would say like, that's the one thing that I've always really loved about the sport is kind of that equality. And in some ways you see more, I mean, I'm sure you could name more successful female speed skaters from the province than you could likely name male, not because they think we've had successful men as well, but you know, we've just had a very um, long legacy of strong women come from the sport. But I think, you know, the perfect example is you look at right now, the CEO for Speed Skating Canada is Susan Ock. So that's for me, one of my mentors in, uh, in the sport and in administration. And um, our last Canada Games, we were able to have Cindy Clausen as one of our coaches. So there's always a way I feel like to bring, you know, to have people stay connected to the sport. And I think part of that is to do with a small sport community. I, I'm not sure if it would be more challenging in bigger uh, organizations, but it, it, um, it, my board has more females than uh, males on it. My president's a, a woman. And I mean, I just think I've been very lucky in that sense to have a lot of uh, women to look at too. Dallas, when you think about it and from more of the coaching aspect, having that female support network, and we talk about the importance of representation and the impact that female coaches can have on female athletes, but even on other coaches, how important is that support network for women? Yeah, well, having had the opposite experience um, coming up through the coaching ranks, I certainly found that creating a network of female coaches was really important. And not just females, I mean, males too, but I certainly... You know, there were points where at the provincial level, we do have a fair amount of females. It's really as you get higher up into the national, international levels, there, there was fewer and fewer women. And I remember this moment at the Commonwealth Games where I looked around pool deck and I had never really, really understood, but not that I didn't understand the women in coaching movement, but I, I didn't feel like I had personally suffered from a lack of women until I was at the highest level and I looked around the pool deck and I realized there was only two of us at diving in all of the Commonwealth. And I thought, what the heck? And it was the first time where I just missed the company of other women. And um, I think that really changed my perspective. And coming out of that competition, I, I started to make a bigger point to get more women together. And, you know, whether it was within the sport or between sports to, to create that network, to share ideas and just get the women's perspective on the coaching life, which is a very different and unique life. And not a lot of women do it. So especially in those days, and why wouldn't we want to kind of support each other? And I have to say through COVID, some of those close friends from across the country who are other female diving coaches have really, you know, I think we really saved each other and helped each other get through this crazy time. But I feel, and I don't know if, if the three of you have felt this, but I know that I can look from my industry, but I feel that there has been a real push for camaraderie as women and creating that female network and that support system of recognizing that there might not be a lot of us in that particular sport, industry, whatever it would be, and really making that effort to support each other and to build on those relationships and create those networks that might not have existed before. And as much as we speak about the importance of having the female representation, we saw in that rally report 
when you're looking at different influences on young female athletes, it can be very much across the board with it. Elizabeth, you could speak to some of the impact that you have seen that parents can have on influencing their young children or their children in female athletes in their sport and continuing in sport. Yeah, if I'm speaking specific to my experience, I think I was very lucky to have uh, parents who let me do what I want or let me pick the sport I wanted to go in and not and not be pressured and forced. And um, I think that's the biggest thing with with kids is, you know, if when we're speaking of a sport specific, you know, um, you know, let them do the sport that they want to do, not necessarily the sport that you think they should do and I think that's such a huge part like it always it has to be they have to enjoy it and I see that in our own provincial team you know if if the athlete isn't enjoying it then they shouldn't have they shouldn't do it you know it, it, and I think um that is something that we see with our, our athletes you know on our team is the most important thing is that they're having fun and creating memories and experiences and uh, success can be measured in many ways. It's not just, you know, being on a podium. Daria, when you speak about fencing being as male dominated as it is, what do you think can be done, maybe change in it, whether you're speaking about sport system as a whole or really from your experience with the fencing community to try to engage more females in sports? Because that was even when you look at this five part series that we have been doing here. The first series that we did was about, the first discussion was about trying to engage more females in sports, particularly after the pandemic and trying to keep young girls into sports and coming back to it. From what you have seen, especially men's in a sport in which there are more males and females, what do you think we can do to try to get more girls involved? I think it really stems back from this idea that there's girl sports and there's boy sports. You know, I think there's just there's just sports. And I think the opportunities that are allotted to the different genders when they first come are coming up, they're very segregated. And I think that to encourage more participation in a wide variety of sports, especially in fencing, which is male dominated, is to show that there isn't a specific sport per gender. If you want to fence, you go and fence. If you know, if you want to go speed skating, you speed skate. If you want to dive, you dive. It's regardless of, of how you identify. And I think exploration camps are absolutely fantastic for figuring out what kind of sport you want to do or just sending your, your, your child to a sport camp in general where they can try a whole bunch of different activities out or signing them up for different sports throughout the year, I think is really important for them to sort of be able to identify with the sport or with a, a coach, a specific coach within a sport and not just not just sign up your child to a sport because you think that that's the sport that a girl should go into when they're, you know, four years old. Sign them up for everything. See what they like. Uh, introduce them to a wide variety. I think that's where that's where we're missing here is we're we're missing that concept of sport is for everybody instead of, you know, you know, gymnastics is only for girls or, you know, figure skate is only for girls. That type of thing is we need to look at the, the wide breadth of sport is sport. Sports for everybody. I love the idea of multi-sport camps and introducing it. It was one thing that I said you're on to that I just think is so important because it's so easy, especially when anyone that's involved there has children involved in sports knows that the push to make children now uh, specialize in a sport early on and maybe not experience and not realize all of the different sports that are out there and that are available for them to try and participate in not, I mean, when you look at the city of Winnipeg or the province of Manitoba, there's so many different options out there for people to become involved in. Okay, going back, we're centering though on the mentorship idea for it. In your mind, Aria, what makes a good mentor? I think the number one thing for me and what makes a good mentor is someone who sort of practices what they preach. If someone is genuine and when they give advice, they also practice that advice. Uh, I think that's really important as, as a piece for a mentor because it's one thing to lecture to someone on, you know, what a coach should do or how a coach should act, but it's seeing that in, in practice and then being able to say, see yourself 
um, in that role as well. So that, that's a pretty big, uh, big piece, I would say. What about for you, Dallas? Yeah, and I was also going to say, um, along with that too, I think be vulnerable and show the difficulties you've had and the challenges you've had and the lessons that you've learned because of that. You know, I think it's all fine and good to give advice, you know, as she was saying, but to also share some of the struggle and how you can come out the other side and some of the, the strategies and tactics you've learned. When you look at it, Elizabeth, even more from an administration side with it, for those that would like to be involved in sport, maybe they've transitioned, they no longer athlete, maybe coaching isn't a right way, but they still want to be involved in it. When you look at it, even from more of an administration sort of standpoint, do you think that, or what do you think can make a good mentor in that respect when looking at trying to expand beyond those initial roles? Yeah, definitely. I think it's, it's different in administration for sure than in the coaching position. But for me, I think, um, you know, one of my mentors that I spend a lot of time speaking with on a regular basis and who's been a big part of my journey and my career it's you know someone who is their strengths are not mine like who can bring something else to the table and gets me out of my comfort zone um and I feel like I've learned so much uh from that person and again like not someone who's always agreeing with me and we have very different uh, different opinions on a lot of uh, topics, but I think that's what's made it such a great mentorship is it helps me, um, you know, open up my mind to other ideas and um, push myself to get out of my comfort zone. Dallas, you were a part, and I want to make sure I get the program correct, you were a part of the Sport Manitoba Coaching Female Mentorship Program. For it. What drew you to this? Um, since you didn't have any female mentors yourself. And maybe that is what drew you to it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, first of all, it's an opportunity to expand my network just by, you know, meeting with other coaches who are both the mentors and the mentees. You know, I truly believe that a mentorship is a two-way interaction. And I know that I get lots of great new ideas from the younger up-and-coming coaches or the less experienced coaches. And Actually, sometimes the questions that they ask really make you think. They really make you think about, you know, why do you stand for something or why do you value something over another, you know, way of doing it? And I, so I think it keeps me on my toes as a coach if I can answer their questions. And then also, I mean, I think it is important. I didn't have any, um, at least not early on. And I, I eventually did make my way into, um, there was back in the day a women in coaching national team apprenticeship program and that was my first experience with a mentorship and it was phenomenal so once I had finally gotten myself into a formal mentorship I really saw the value in it and yeah I really love the opportunity to do it both formally and informally I know in our club we also set up uh, less formal mentorships I mean there's still kind of formal we have you know this coach working with that one etc and one of our mentors is male so we rotate around so that you know there's female and male mentors but we're making sure that the young coaches are getting you know just access to that expertise sorry you've been a part of that program as well for it and what do you take away from it and even tying into what elizabeth said about you know, finding towards that we don't have the same sort of skill set that you have and when you look at a program what you and Dallas have been involved in, yes, the common theme of being coaches for it, but how much can you take from learning from other from other coaches of other sports? Um, I had a really great experience of, with ours. I was a mentee, so I think Dallas, you're probably a mentor, but I was a mentee and I, I loved it. I, I had never had, since um, my own coach, I hadn't had a female mentor as a coach. And so when I got in, I got uh, Janine Stevens, who is a celebrated coach, celebrated Olympic athlete. And I was very lucky to have her. However, our sports are wildly different. Like you couldn't pick like further sports away from each other. But was what was really great about the program and what was really great about having a, a mentor just as another coach was just to talk about different ideas not only different coaching strategies, but the pressures of being a coach. What are, what are the ways that we can then 
um, you know, deal with different issues, mental health issues, even um, as a coach and, and how do, how do other people deal with it? And I thought it was really great to sort of brainstorm and, and sort of, you know, bounce different ideas off of uh, a mentor from a different coach and sort of see things from a different perspective. Cause sometimes when you're stuck in your own sport, you get a little bit introspective and you want to make sure that you can see, uh, see the light out. And it was really great to have, have that experience with someone else from a different sport when you mentioned being the mentee or it's so your perspective and, and maybe Janine would have been a better person to answer this then, but what, what in your mind, what makes a good mentee for it? Because we talk about mentor, but it is a two way street before it. And it is, it can be collaborative and both parties getting something out of it in your mind, having been the mentee as well, what is it that you feel um, is important when going into a situation like that? I think approaching things out of curiosity, I think um, understanding that there are so many ways to do things and picking up different tidbits of what works, um, you know, what works for you, different types of strategies, always asking questions. I think, I think that's the, the best thing about being a mentee is you have so many questions and just ask your questions. I think a mentor, all they, wanna, they want is to be able to help and they don't maybe know how to help. So always asking questions, being willing to sort of um, be genuine and vulnerable as, as sort of Dallas had mentioned on the, the mentor side, but also being vulnerable as a, a mentee to sort of understand and to be recognized, maybe what are my weaknesses as a coach and, and how can I then get support from that? And I think is, is also really important. Elizabeth, for those that would like to, people watching right now, listening to this, you know, aren't interested in going into that coaching avenue, but are interested, as I mentioned in the administration, administrative side, what in your mind is a good place for people to start? How do you, how do you get involved in it? If you don't have maybe a natural connection to it, um, <laughs> the same yeah, way it wasn't nepotism. <laughs> no, I'm not, that's not what I'm implying. I mean, no, or if you didn't grow up at, if you didn't grow up at the Oval all the time, but you want to be able to continue on what from when looking from your perspective, do you look for um, for people that are trying to become more involved on that side. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting, definitely. I mean, I'm biased because I'm in the administrative role, but I think it's an often a part of sport that it gets no credit. <laughs> and we all, and not that we shouldn't, like the coaches are amazing and they, you know, we're so lucky to have such great coaches. And of course you want to highlight your athletes, but it's kind of a part of the sport, I find that gets forgotten about. And I, I think a lot of the time, especially with COVID, you're just this person behind emails all the time. So, um, but I mean, for me, I, I didn't actually ever see myself necessarily going into this um, type of work, uh, probably until, you know, I, I, was in school trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I was kind of more into the kinesiology pathway. And then I, um, same as Daria, I actually did the, the recreation management and community development uh, degree from sport, uh, not sport Manitoba, from University of Manitoba. And I think that's kind of when I started thinking, you know, maybe sport is a good option for me. And um, honestly, I can't imagine not, you know, working in any other industry at this point. Um, in my career, I think this is probably where I'll stay. Um, that being said, yeah, I think if that's um, something you're interested in, definitely that degree, if you're looking from a school perspective um, within the province and actually across Canada, to be honest, there aren't a ton of sport management specific options at universities. There are a few, um, but I, I'm, the ones I'm thinking of are mostly in Ontario or maybe a couple in BC but I think the um, you know the sport or the recreation management degree is a great option but also if you are into business that's a great option as well because really once you get into the administration side it's a business you're operating a business and um, so that's a good that would be a great option too from uh, uh, an, edu an education standpoint. I think I'll just add one thing. The biggest misconception I think with the job is you don't have to be a great athlete to be an administrator, a great administrator of the sport. So I think like for me every day, if I say to someone, oh, I'm the executive director for speed skating Manitoba, they immediately assume I am an Olympian speed skater 
and think I still skate and and it's funny I just kind of go with it at this point I'm they, oh you, yeah I used to skate like it's they don't really understand that there is a business to the provincial sport organizations so I would just say you know it's a great option maybe if you aren't uh, going that pathway as an athlete but you still love the sport it's a great option to stay involved absolutely another great path for women to become in more involved in sport as we try to continue it not just again not just from an athlete or coach's perspective but trying to get more women represented throughout all different avenues of sport dallas and jari both from a coaching perspective when you look at the rep the importance of representation we know we know how important it is but to have that female representation for other female athletes. But what can the benefit be so the female coach in general can add to male athletes as well? Because obviously there's such an impact that a coach can have on any athlete. Dallas, we'll start with you. Yeah, I, I actually, I mean, I've always coached males and females. Um, I come from a sport where they're they're training together, which I think is awesome. It's not true in all sports. And I actually really love that about our sport. Um, and I have to say from participant all the way to, you know, the national medalist, it's been a, a pretty 50-50 split for me. And I think that, you know, females coaching males in general has great benefits for society. And in particular, I think that males having female coaches or mentors leads to males being comfortable with a female in a leadership role in their life later on in the workplace or, you know, in the family, et cetera. I think that, you know, males who are in a training program with a female head coach will be comfortable, you know, in a company with a female CEO or might even be drawn to a company that has a female CEO or other high level executives. And I think this is where we want society to head. We don't want um, the males to see women as, um, anything less than able to achieve and lead at that level. And, you know, I, I see a little bit as chicken and the egg, you know, you get more males comfortable with female leadership. And then the more males are comfortable with female leadership, the more females will have probably a decent experience being a leader. And then that will lead to more female leaders, you know, which will lead to more confident female leaders and, and then more males that will be confident with them, you know? So I just think, you know, it's not to underestimate the role of, male youth being coached by females and having those strong female mentors Jeremy, and actually look, just if yeah. I could add one more thing recently on this topic I had an interesting experience one of my athletes is exploring options uh in the NCAA and you know doing all the coach interviews and all that stuff and one coach who's a male uh in their dialogue the athlete had said you know saying that you sound a lot like my coach Dallas this coach is male and knows who I am from the international scene and he said, oh, that is such a great compliment. And I literally asked my athlete to repeat it twice because I was so surprised. And I just thought, why is that? Like, why is it that we're so surprised to hear a male coach saying, it's a great compliment to be compared to a female coach? You know, but I think it's not that common. Yeah, absolutely. For it. And hopefully, it, you know, as the years continue to go by, it will become much more it will become much more common with it Dari when you think about it and being a female coach in a sport that that is so dominated or what do you see as being the benefit of being a female coach for male athletes um I think it's uh, fairly similar, probably the, with Dallas's situation where I coach both male and female athletes. Like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. They all train together. They just compete in uh, different groups. I think there's this big misconception with the old boys club that only, you know, male coaches can coach male athletes and, but male coaches can coach female athletes and female coaches can coach female athletes, whereas female coaches can't coach male athletes. And I think that's a, this big misconception and having more female coaches coach male athletes and go to competitions with them and have them be visible is just um, another reassurance, I think, for the state of female coaching and the fact that um, male coaches are not or male athletes are not then going to you know put up a, an argument for not having or for having a female coach. And I've seen that before where a female coach is, is put onto a male team and some of the guys who have never been coached by a woman uh, are just 
they, they're not confident in that. They're like, well, what, what is a woman doing coaching, you know, my team, I'm a guy, but why is it perfectly acceptable for a guy to coach uh, a woman's team and no one asks any questions? So I think the more that we have those experiences, the more that we have women coaching uh, men in, um, in, in tournaments or in public, there's going to be that reinforcement that it doesn't matter. No one is, no one's better than the other one just based on their, on their gender. They're better because they're a better coach. And I think that's a really important piece that we want to get across. Absolutely. Back to that idea, the importance of being able to, if you, if you see it, you can be it <laughs> sort of idea as well with it. Now I have interspersed, just trying to keep an eye well um, on our time here. I have been adding some of the questions that the audience submitted into this in the interest of trying to get in as many questions as possible. But we are gonna turn over to answer a few more questions from the audience now. But before we do that, let's take a quick break with Bison Transport. Um, so, I was at the top of the track and you can just see going into corner one is just, it dives down and you can't see anything else. And you just know, okay, this is gonna be intense. And uh, went down, it felt like I got thrown around in a garbage can, that's the best way I could describe it. And just the, the pressures are really, really tough and they just drag you down to the bottom of the sled. You can't see anything. We'll have the maple leaf there. Nice. With our number. Yeah. Or is it number maple leaf? Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> You never know what you're going to be great at until you actually try everything. And just because there's maybe not socially accepted to do something, it doesn't matter. You got to still try that because, you know, it could bring you to Olympics or it could bring you to wherever you need to go and you're going to be really happy. And a big thank you to Bison Transport for helping with this sports leadership series that we've had on. All right, so here are some of the questions that have been submitted, please, and I want to make sure that we try to get to as many as possible. I'm going to start off with you, Elizabeth. All right. If you could go back and mentor your younger self, what would you say? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> um, I probably would have tried, I, I think my mom's listening, so probably would have tried <laughs> to listen to her a bit more, I think. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah that not everything was wrong, um, but just be, yeah, a little bit more. I was very driven, and I don't regret the pathway I took, but I think, um, you know, been a little bit more open-minded to what other people's uh, uh thoughts were and encouragement and not try to I was very stubborn not try to do everything on myself on my own it's one of my favorite questions that what could you go back and what would you go back and tell your younger self it's one of the ones that when I'm interviewing athletes that I'm always so intrigued about as well because right? I think it's so interesting when everyone has that perspective now of being older what would you tell yourself when you were first starting out Dallas what would you tell yourself uh, I think it would be, I mean, it's fine. I would say find that balance between taking advantage of opportunities, but also like drawing some limits somewhere and not taking on everything and saying yes to everything. Um, I mean, I definitely wanted to do everything and it was exciting, but then at times it was just too much. So I think just valuing yourself and your time and saying yes. I, I heard a really great phrase the other day. It was not just learning to say no, but taking back the art of saying yes. I like it. Daria, what would a young Daria be hearing? Oh, what would young Daria be hearing or listening? Um, <laughs> I think uh, when I look back and if I look back maybe more on my like a competitive career, um, I was so focused on like the winning and like the like really like competitive piece. And I kind of, I would tell myself to really just 
enjoy it more and enjoy it for what it is in that time. And I think sometimes we always focus as athletes or as coaches, we always focus on that end goal and really focusing on the journey of getting there and all those moments and all those pieces that brought us to that end. Cause I look back and I, and I, I think about the experiences that I had and I had some really great experiences. And sometimes I wish I had just lived in those experiences a little bit more instead of worrying about what am I doing next? What's my next step? You know, where's my end goal instead of, you know, appreciating the journey as, as part of that as well. One of the audience members wants to know what your advice would be to young coaches just starting out. Daria? Ask questions. I think exploring everything from a point of curiosity. I think uh, starting out coaching, find as many coaches that you can talk to about what they do. I think a beautiful thing about coaching is that there isn't always um, a wrong or right way to coach. There's a right way to coach for you. And I think figuring out what your path is by learning about how other people coach and why they do things a certain way. And maybe that's something that you want to do. I think approaching it, it from that perspective is that there's no right way, there's no wrong way, there's a right way for you and that you need to find out what that is. And you, you do that by talking to other coaches and asking questions. Dallas, now I, second part to that question. Sorry? No, I was going to say a second part to that question was advice you'd give to established coaches when it comes to dealing with young coaches that are just be getting their feet wet and getting the experience in that realm what advice would you give i would say um a little bit feeding off what daria said that i think young coaches need to learn to do it their way and you don't want to create a bunch of mini me's uh i think diversity really does make a program stronger. And I mean, COVID was a fabulous example where when it came to the technology and learning how to do things in a new way, frankly, my younger coaches were teaching me. And <laughs> that was awesome. And I, I think just, you know, there's no one, set, one size fits all for coaching and you can learn the technique, you can learn the technical ins and outs of the sport, but the way you apply that, the style that you have, the way you communicate, I think that all young coaches should be in a position where they can explore the way they want to do it and bring themselves to the, to the environment. When you speak about, you use that, that new technology and your young coaches teaching you, and both you and Daria speaking before we started here tonight, we're, just, we're talking about having to get so creative during it and trying to host the online you know, coaching sessions and with your athletes for fencing. I mean, I don't know how you, I don't know how you coach that online or same thing with diving, but just being able to expand and think outside the box is usually something that coaches have really had to be able to adapt to. Uh, Elizabeth, if you have somebody that's looking to get involved in sport, maybe as an athlete that doesn't have any connection to speed skating, what advice do you give in trying to seek out um, and get involved in a new sport? Yeah, it's interesting. I'm feeling a lot of the, fielding a lot of those questions these days because we always uh, tend to get um, a spike in popularity around the Olympics. So uh, we have a few uh, of our clubs are offering open houses. Um, we had a, a the national open house uh, going on throughout the Olympics. So across the country, all the clubs are running open houses. So there's a couple of opportunities coming up in the next few weeks um, uh, around the Winnipeg area and just outside, but um, usually I, if they contact us through our social media or you know find our website, um, we just direct them to the, the club that's best suited to them and uh, try to set up an opportunity for them to give it a try. Which is so great. Goes back my when I made the comment earlier about loving the multi-sport camps, everything like that. I love, I mean, open houses. Again, looking at it from the perspective of a parent of trying to get, if you're trying to get your child more involved or try different sports, the open houses are perfect to be able to mm -hmm. give them an idea and as families to be able to see what the sport itself is about. How do you think that we reach the girls who have left sport? I think mean, that is one of the biggest issues that I think we're going to see coming out of the pandemic, kids in general, but especially young girls that have left sport 
over the last couple of years and maybe aren't enticed right now to be able to come back in. When you look at it, Daria, what do you think some things that we can do to try to get girls back involved? Um, I think it's all about intentionality. I think uh, being intentional about who we want to get back into sport and providing them with opportunities. And, you know, like as Elizabeth had mentioned, there's so many opportunities in sport. It's not just about being a coach. It's not just about being an athlete. There's so many opportunities as, you know, a manager, as administrator, as technical director, as a board member. And I think it's really um, not only just the sport itself, but it's who we are as coaches, I think, to bring people back. I think, you know, Dallas can probably say it as well. People people will leave the sport. It, it happens. Um, but what we can do is we can provide them with opportunities. I always um, try and encourage people to take refereeing courses because that's also another pathway in, in, in fencing um, or coaching courses or armory courses or getting them involved on committees or boards or finding them a way to still stay connected because sometimes they'll come back. And I think that's another really important piece is to understand that being a part of sport, you're, the journey isn't just as an athlete, it's a lifelong journey. And how are you going to participate in sport throughout your whole life and, and just providing them with the opportunities to kickstart sort of that journey. Over the years, Dallas, when you think about your coaching experience, and I know that you'd have many experiences similar to Darian that Athletes come and go, some decide to stay in the sport, some decide not to, but to try to keep them in some capacity in, in sport or bringing them back to it. From what you've seen in your experience with athletes, what do you think some steps are that we should look at? Well, I think the most important thing is the culture. I think the environment that they're walking into every day, you know, um, there are sometimes in sport, it can get overly competitive to the point where it loses the fun. And I think, you know, sport is meant to provide uh, absolutely a chance to pursue your goals and your dreams, but also connection with other, other people, girls, in my case, girls and boys who don't necessarily go to your school, who aren't necessarily exactly your same age. You can find kids that you connect with that, you know, you may not have in your classroom. And I think, that the environment and the culture needs to be really supportive and accepting and, you know, not trying to fit everyone into a box so that everyone feels really welcome, uh, just in their natural state, you know, that they're not trying to conform to a specific type of person to fit in it, at that sport. I think that's really important. And I think just also having a, within the culture, kind of that cheering for each other bit. You know that yeah you're competitors in a way and you're when it comes time to compete you're you're up against each other but that you're all rooting for each other and you're in it together i think that that's really important especially for girls as we get ready to close this out you have one more question that to ask and it someone had submitted that they have a six-year-old daughter and so they wanted to know given that living in manitoba which sport would you recommend would be most fitting for her? And we have three different sports here for many, but maybe from when you're looking at it, because it can be overwhelming for it, what are some, some tips that you could give parents even what they should watch for, they should look for to, when they're trying to find a sport that might fit their, their child or their daughter well? Area. I think summer camps. I mean, some people have mentioned summer camps earlier, and I think most sports offer summer camps. It's a great way when you're young to try a bunch of things in a short period of time and have some fun. I think, uh, I guess to build also on what Dallas was saying, I think summer sports or um, summer camps are really great. Also, when you're choosing a sport from that, I think um, to go even sort of deeper into that, when you're looking at a club or um, a sports system is just to look at, look around at who the coaches are, look at it, look at the club. And I think Dallas got it right on the head when we talked about culture. If you go and visit the club and you look at the culture and you see who's around and who's been around for a while, and you can kind of get that sense of 
what is sport, sport supposed to bring you? Do you have someone that your, your child could look up to in that club? Do you think that they would be supported in that club? You know, is there, um, are there numerous people involved at different levels or is it only high performance? I think there's a sort of that breadth of when you join a sport, you kind of join a family as well. And uh, don't be scared to ask those questions of the, the sports and the clubs that you're getting involved in because that could be something that your child's involved with for their whole life. And you wanna make sure that, you know, they're surrounded by uh, really great people, really great mentors, really great coaches. When you mentioned the camps, make sure you mention that Sport Manitoba has a girls multi-sport series as well that is definitely worth checking out and find out more information on their website. Okay, as we wrap, because it is unfortunately that time, I do want to know quickly, Daria, when you look at fencing, what is the youngest of, that you can get into fencing here in Manitoba? I take as young as five and uh, as old as you want to give me as and we even have wheelchair fencing. So uh, we'll take them all. <laughs> That's fantastic. Dallas, what about from a diving perspective? Yeah, we have uh, programs actually where they don't even get into the water, but they get to use the trampolines and all our dry land facilities for four to six year olds. And then in the water, honestly, as soon as they can swim in the deep end. So we've had as young as five and six. Four to six year olds. How about 41 year olds? <laughs> oh yeah, we have an adult okay. program too. <laughs> and Elizabeth, for, for speed skating as well, what is the earliest years um, that people can become involved with it? Yeah, I mean, some of the clubs will have in their learn to skate programs, kids as young as three. So uh, pretty young, but again, it's something that we, if you kind of see a sport for life range, you know, we have athletes in their 70s who will still go out to clubs and to the oval so there's a opera I, and i kind of touching on what they were saying earlier it's um not just high performance which i think is often what you see of our three sports is likely just the high performance end but knowing that there's recreational opportunities for everyone as well well and great to be able to get that information out because i do think it's true that so many people with a number of sports that you think about that you do think that you have to be, you're very committed and on a pathway to some elite level, whereas there are the recreational, and, and you're never too old. We've also found out you're pretty much not too young, but you're never too old to become involved <laughs> in it as well. An important, an important message as we try to make sure that we continue to see um, not only people, but girls, and then people of all ages to be able to become involved and stay involved in sport. I want to thank all of you, Daria, Dallas, Elizabeth, so much for spending some of your evening with us here and providing the insights and the experiences that you've had to our audience. Appreciate it a great deal. Thank you so much for sharing those experiences. And to everyone who tuned in, a big thank you for joining us for this final session of the Bison Transport Sport Leadership Series. I hope you enjoyed tonight and all the sessions throughout the series that featured a wide variety of topics. I mentioned we talked about girls wanting to get back into sport, building on Indigenous youth, leadership, equity, diversity, and inclusion. If you missed any of those series, please go to Sport Manitoba's YouTube channel or sportmanitoba.ca. All five are available on demand. This series, of course, would not be possible without the support of our title sponsor, Bison Transport. On that website, also on the Sport Manitoba website, you will also find information about Sport Manitoba's coaching female mentorship program. You heard Dallas speak about it, Daria, as well, and other initiatives involving women and girls in sport. We would like to hear from you as well. A survey will be sent out for your feedback on the series, asking what sort of topics going forward would you like to hear about? and suggestions for the next series. So thank you so much for joining us throughout all of this, the Bison Transport Sport Leadership Series. Again, thank you to our sponsors. Take care, everybody, and good night.